Hello, and welcome to Unheard. I'm Sally Chatterton, Unheard's editor. Today, we're going to talk about one of the most difficult, divisive, and emotive issues affecting our politics, culture, and medicine today. It's gender identity. Most importantly, we're going to talk about how it is affecting our children and how gender incongruity, that's the idea that you're born in the wrong body, is being treated by the NHS in the under-17s. Until a year ago, most young people experiencing any sort of gender-related distress were referred to GIDS, the Gender Identity Development Service, at the world-renowned Tavistock and Portman Trust. This service, tiny at first, had grown over three decades into an operation that was understaffed, under pressure, and suddenly uncertain as to whether its approach was the right one. As a result, staff turned whistleblowers and its protocols and patients came under scrutiny. Amid serious concerns, a review by Hilary Cass was commissioned. This delivered its interim verdict just over a year ago, and it was that JIDS should be closed down. But what is going to take its place? There are hundreds of confused youngsters seeking help, and where can they expect to find it? Kathleen Stock, unheard columnist, has spent the past month investigating what the new gender service for children might look like. Will it have learned the lessons from JIDS? And what hope do those kids have? She's going to talk through some of her findings with us today. Welcome, Kathleen. Hi. So, Kathleen, perhaps we should start at the beginning and you might set the scene for us. Um, explain why JIDS was set up. What, what is or what, what was JIDS? JIDS was a service for children um, and adolescents who um, had gender dysphoria, which is now being represented as gender incongruence. But... It was the children who were in extreme distress about um, their sexed bodies, and many of whom um, had the idea that they really should have been born um, as the opposite sex. And that was a small number, a relatively small number of patients. Um, but in the last 10 years, more, I, I suppose, um, it, the, the numbers have exponentially rocketed up because it was young generally it was young boys wasn't it it was back in the 80s wasn't it, it set up yes i mean it was it was very rare that a child <laughs> would um be sent to jids it was it was considered to be a very exceptional disorder and it was considered to be a disorder social trends changed it became the 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 disorder became more well known which seemed to have partly produced more patients because more people more kids heard about it and that gave them way i think to explain their own experience or whatever the explanation is, the pa patient um, referrals rose very quickly. They rocketed, didn't they? And in the course of that um, most recent period in JID's history, um, they started using puberty blockers, which are powerful drugs that, as they would say, pause puberty in order to give you time to think. Um, they also it is suggested by some studies, do other things that aren't quite so mm. benign, yes. um, as, as perhaps we'll discuss. What then happened? Why did, why, did the, why did crisis occur? As far as I can see, having read um, the judicial review um, documents, having looked at Hannah Barnes's book, which is meticulous, um, having looked at the Care Quality Commission report, um, there was a number of problems there all along, um, part, particularly to do with record keeping. They don't seem to have any records accurate records of how many patients they actually gave those drugs to. So there was poor record keeping. There was um, insufficient uh, assessments, psychological assessments prior to uh, being sent to the endocrine nonologists. Um, and there was also so insufficient in quality, insufficient in quantity. There was, um, as, as later reviews have shown, the CAS review in particular, which we'll come on to, mm. but that's an independent review that was commissioned into GIDS has shown there was very poor communication between psychologists and endocrinologists at um, University College Hospital. So it's just a range of problems in administering these powerful drugs in order supposedly to have therapeutic effects, but also they were the, the waiting lists grew, uh, the number of patients they were supposed to see was um, far more than they could cope with. So there was just a number of problems there. And so Hilary Cass was called in. Yes. Um, so Hilary Cass is a distinguished paediatrician. She's a former president of the Royal College of Paediatrics. And she was brought in um, 
in 2021, I think, yeah, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. to, to do an independent review into the service. Um, and she then came to the conclusion that the service had to be closed. Um, and she's recommended a new structure, which involves two new services in the medium term, one based in the south of England called the Southern Hub, which is a partnership between Great Ormond Street, um, the Evelina Children's Hospital and South London and Maudsley um, NHS Trust, and one based in the north of England, which is a partnership between Older Hay Children's Hospital and Royal Manchester Children's Hospital. And those are supposed to be the first two services, but ultimately she wants other regional centres as well. So we're in a transition period now. Actually, GIDS is, has not closed. Um, and the director, uh, Polly Carmichael, the, Dr. Polly Carmichael, the, the clinical psychologist who oversaw the service uh, through um, all of the problems that I've just described, mm. is still in, in place. I, and I interviewed Hannah Barnes, actually, and she was the one person who she was willing to sort of name as someone who was possibly part of the problem. Um, right, well, she's, yet, still, she's in still in place. Involved. She's still in place, and they still manage... Um, a cohort of a thousand, around a thousand patients, that's what their website says. Um, the, what they are is close to new referrals. So um, the waiting list is being managed by a separate entity now, not by GIDS itself. And um, it's an, another NHS trust. Do you know how long that waiting list is? I think it's over 7,000. As of, Well, as of July, it was over 7,000. And presumably it's growing because um, the Southern Hub and the Northern Hub have yet to... Uh, start receiving patients or doing any kind of patient care. JIDS is close to new referrals, so there's this void um, where proper care should be. And there are other people who are involved as well, aren't there, um, in the new pilot schemes that, who were involved in the original JIDS, aren't there? Yes, yeah, so something that I um, discovered in researching this piece is that the figures from the old, some would say discredited service are prominent in the new hubs. Um, one of them, by his own admission, is Professor Gary Butler, who is the chief endocrinologist at University College Hospital. Routinely prescribed um, puberty blockers as well. He, he is on record himself uh, talking to the Daily Mail a few years ago saying that he routinely prescribes um, puberty blockers to what he describes as children with lifelong gender dysphoria. Um, so he, he um, gave a speech to a conference uh, this year where he just said that he had been employed in the new hub, the southern hub. He was very critical of uh, Hilary Cass. I was he, going to say, how does he feel about Yes, he doesn't seem to feel very there. well disposed towards her. He, in this speech anyway, perhaps he was, uh, you know, being a bit colourful, but he, he kind of made a joke about nepotism that somehow he implied that it was nepotism that she was involved in the hospitals in particular were involved he said that nobody in these hospitals um or the hospitals rather had no experience of dealing with gender dysphoria or incongruence um but he he described himself as um having fought back to be able to continue to provide endocrine services to trans-identified children. It's interesting, isn't it? So that means that sort of what was therapeutic is becoming clinical, which is... is that... Well, that's the, that's the whole um, interest, interesting thing about puberty blockers is that um, you're prescribing this extremely powerful drug that has effects on the whole body and the brain in order to alleviate psychological distress. And that's unusual. I mean, of course, psychiatrists, psychiatrists rather, um, pre often prescribe um, mood altering drugs, mm. but this is not just mood altering. And, and also psychiatrists tend to be um, quite cautious when giving them to children. So there's a number of ways in which this is unusual. And, and that, that speaks to a theme that really emerged for me in researching the piece, you know, I already knew it, but it really became underlined that gender medicine is exceptionalized. It is not historically anyway treated as part of wider medical structures. As mm -hmm. soon as a, a child is diagnosed with a gender identity disorder or dysphoria, um, what Cass, Hilary Cass calls diagnostic overshadowing takes place, which that sort of thing becomes very prominent in everyone's mind. And they sort of 
forget to look at the wider, what's going on for that child mm. in her mental health, in her home situation, is she autistic and so on. And that's one of the things that she wanted to do isn't it? in her interim report, mm. that's what she yeah, said. Yeah, so it's it? very clear that in Cass's recommendations thus far, in her interim report, and then also in the, um, they've, they've, NHS England have now released an interim service specification for these new services moving forward, it's very clear that they want to bring haul back gender medicine for children and adolescents into wider paediatric practice. Because there are comorbidities as well, aren't there, affecting what the, the sorts yes. of children who are presenting? Yes, with. so there's a relatively high uh, number in this cohort of autistic children or children that are neurodiverse. There's also um, a high number of girls. I mean, yeah. sex is definitely relevant in this. And, that, and that's the ironic thing, of course, that we're not supposed to describe these girls as female, but they are female and that is relevant causally to why they're in this mm. cohort. And um, there's also uh, same-sex attraction tends to be um, disproportionately represented. Mm -hmm. So affirmation is this, um, it's really at the heart of the dispute yeah. um, about how to treat this cohort of children and adolescents. And it's whether we should affirm their identities as in uh, believe them in inverted commas or believe their experience, in other words, kind of accede to their way of presenting themselves, um, not challenge it in any, well, not, I think really not challenge it, although there's some argument about whether that, so, so people these days who are promoting affirmation will often say, but it's also compatible with exploration. But the question is, is it really? Mm. <laughs> if you can't say this is a female, <laughs> if you can't utter the word she, if you can't, if you have to um, use the pronouns that um, you're being asked to use with a child, the child is asking you to, in what way can you really explore alternatives where in fact um, they're you know they're really the sex that they are? Yeah. One of the people who you quote in your piece um, describes um, affirming a child, you you need to absolutely believe them. Um, Yes. Because it's, and she compares it with if a child is... Disclosing sexual abuse. Se yes, disclosing sexual so abuse. So that comes from a trans woman clinician who heads up an adult gender service. And there's quite a bit in the piece about adult gender services because they effectively have access to, um, I would say, children aged 17, yes. <laughs> or at least adolescents yes. aged 17. Because let's um, bear in mind as well that what we're talking about at the moment are kids under 17. Or yes, we're children. talking about under 17 mm. year olds, but as soon as you get to um, the age of 17, and that's another aspect of the piece, um, every, every 17 year old on the waiting list, existing waiting list for JIDS has been sent a letter saying why um, you should transfer to an adult waiting list. So there's a whole separate discussion, perhaps we'll have in a minute about what's happening there, but this is a clinician uh, Dr. Christine Mimna, who um, in an interview I found said, made this comparison <laughs> between um, a child telling you that she's been sexually abused, in which case you should believe her and you shouldn't discount her experience and you shouldn't say, um, no, that didn't happen, and a child telling you that she's a boy. And so the affirmatory um, approach is one side. The exploratory approach is the other side, mm -hmm. um, and so and that there's presumably there's a tension. Advocates of affirmation tend to deny that there's any tension, but the the critics would say yes, of course there's a tension because you have to find the language to be able to talk to the child and say that things might not be as mm -hmm. you think they are. Within the treatment of gender dysphoria, there is, seems to be there are two approaches: the affirmatory approach and the exploratory mm. approach. And so, are those two at odds? Would you say the advocates of affirmation? tend to insist that it is compatible with exploration and exploration meaning really exploring what's going on here and not necessarily making a, f a foregone conclusion <laughs> that the child will transition. But critics say, no, you can't actually have proper open-ended exploration if you are confined by um, having to use the preferred pronouns, the terminology of the child and often the child's parents. Um, you have to be able to say, I'm afraid you are a female, mm. and so on. And so is the problem, therefore, not just going to be represented in these new hubs if the same people are Well, this is charge? the question. No, no, because, there's, because what seems to have happened is that um, the new hubs, the managers in the new hubs, for whatever reason, the people I talked to thought it was probably um, ignorance rather than anything 
more sinister. They just didn't understand the complexity, the ideological complexity of this area. But they have, they have employed on the same teams um, people who are very pro-affirmation and people who um, are not, who are very much more, um, who are against affirmation really, or certainly against automatic affirmation. And that's producing a lot of tension on these teams because as someone said to me um, who, who is involved, um, you know, you can't say yes and no at the same time. Mm. You've, got, you've got to come to a conclusion mm. and uh, there seems to be some degree of deadlock. So, but at least concerns are being aired, which they weren't, they were shut down initially. At yes, GIST. I mean, I don't think I talked to anyone who said that things were worse than they are. I mean, they're very, the, the, the overarching sense I get from people who are critical of affirmation is that they're very pleased uh, that Cass is on board. They feel immensely heartened by her approach so mm. far. It seems clearly to be bringing gender medicine into the fold of uh, standard methodologies for paediatric practice mm. and for uh, adolescent child and, and adolescent mental health. Um, so from that perspective, they're happy. It's just that on, on the ground, in implementing this service specification, in producing training materials for new cl clinicians, there's quite a lot of um, discord and then there's this wider worry about the atmosphere in trusts and hospitals because mm. a lot of them have been rainbow washed, as it were. Well, I was, I was <laughs> going to say one of the problems as well at Jizz was the fact that mermaids were so you know, closely involved with it mm -hmm. and also gendered intelligence. Mm -hmm. And what I thought was interesting was that there's a statement from gendered intelligence which said they welcomed the closure of Jids and the improvement of gender services for young people as Jids had become a symbolic centre around which anti-gender arguments had revolved for years. Um, and I wonder whether this is going to be rectified with the new service. Because another thing that's happening as well, isn't it, um, Cass is going to, is she suggesting that we, she roll out um, puberty blocker trials, which haven't been... Yes, I mean, that's, um, Cass has insisted that if puberty blockers are to be prescribed in future, it can only be under the auspices of a clinical trial. I think in the, in a draft of the new service specification for puberty blockers that I saw, there is one clause that says, unless circumstances are very exceptional or something mm. like that. But but mainly, you've got to be on a trial. But equally, there was someone you quoted who said that that would be insane. Yeah, so I did talk to a research manager who has very, an NHS uh, clinical trial uh, manager, rather, who had very strong views mm. about this and who felt that this would have to be what is called a CTIMP, this clinical trial. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to remind, <laughs> tell you what that stands for, but CTIMP is like the, the gold standard of clinical trials. Now, for what um, I looked at the original ethics application of um, JIDs when they were um, proposing their uh, study, their early intervention study uh, back a few years ago about puberty blockers, and they did not tick the box that said it was a CTIMP. If it's going to happen at all, it will have to be a CTIMP. And the standards governing CTIMPs are very, very high. And if there's any, the slightest risk to participants, and particularly to children, then that will be heavily factored in, in the ethics, mm. in, in, in scrutiny of the ethics of the thing. She said there's lots of other things you could do. You could um, look at animal studies. You could do a deep dive into the existing literature of these drugs on other um, populations. For instance, those that, that go through precocious there are children that go through precocious puberty where mm. these drugs have been used. So there's lots and lots of things you could do other than a clinical trial on these children who, let's recall, remember, have are physically healthy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they don't have precocious puberty. They don't have, they're not intersex or whatever the sort of myth about these children are. They're just average children mm. um, who have been given this extremely um, powerful drug with, and there is some evidence of uh, impact on renal function, on uh, liver function, on Bone density. cognitive function. So all of those risks, you know, we don't know much about them. Just the suggestion of them, she said, would be enough to mean that a, a C-TIMP wouldn't be possible. So I, I don't know if that's true, but it's interesting. In terms of um, prescribing the puberty blockers for children, does that help their mental health? Would that? There, well, there's, I mean, everything about this um, practice is, is disputed, but there's increasing evidence that... Um, well, the evidence is mixed because very recently, in the last month even, I think, um, somebody has reanalyzed some of the data that came out of JIDS about there being no change to mental health on puberty blockers. And it turned out that if you disaggregate um, the findings, there was a lot of change. <laughs> um, that it, but it, in, in, in kids, some basically some really improved and some really deteriorated. 
And if you average it out, it looks like there's no change. But in fact, that wasn't, well, at least that's one way of putting it. There's a different way of putting it as well. Is there, so is there um, conflict within, as far as you know, the, the pilots with regard to the, t the testing? Questions for me is the same endocrinology department seem to be involved yeah. again. Also at Leeds, that's another thing that my research uncovered. Deep in the minutes of an older Hay board meeting, um, it was announced that the Leeds endocrinology department would be the, would be now associated with this new Northern Hub. Now that's exactly the one that was involved in the satellite clinic of JIDS, as described in Hannah Barnes's book. But, and if you look at shut down. if you look at the um, endocrinology department or the the subset of the department that's involved with Leeds JIDS, their website's still live as part of the Leeds Children's Hospital and um, they've all got their pronouns listed, so. <laughs> and so would you say that they're in danger of repeating old mistakes at the moment? I would say they're in danger of it, mm. yes. From the outside, it seems to me that um, the <laughs> that there is a, a lot of uh, activism still in hospital trusts. Um, they, they A lot of them are signed up to charter mark schemes, LGBT charter mark What's schemes. That? Well, like Stonewall's um, diversity champion scheme was the right. sort of... Oh original one of those. NHS England is still a Stonewall diversity champion, for instance. But there's also new ones. There's um, the, the Rainbow Badge Scheme, which is an accreditation scheme that's now being rolled out. And, and some of the trusts involved in these hubs are, are rainbow badged, um, which means that the LGBT Foundation, for instance, who is associated with this scheme, can look at all their policies and say, you need to do this. You know, you need to get rid of gendered language in your maternity services, mm. or you need to make sure that everybody knows to ask for pronouns. So in, to some degree, these activist organizations are still having an influential effect on the environment in which these children are being cared for. Um, and there's also the staff networks, the LGBT staff networks, which tend to be very transactivist, pro-affirmation um, and you know, so it's not inconceivable that there will be some degree of resistance to Cass's measures in these hubs. And among the people that you spoke to, what was their, their key concern, do you think? I think part of the concern is that um, because I discovered uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, the discord within the Southern Hub is basically, well, I don't know, <laughs> there is a hold up in the Southern right. Hub now. Do, should we should talk about the Southern yes. Hub then? Yes, I mean, I don't know that that's a result of the discord. Um, but I do know that last week, um, very suddenly, it was announced that, um, so they were about to roll out their training materials, they were about to start teaching new clinicians, um, everything's been paused. And the training materials were being formulated by... By these te the, uh, by, by a Gary? team that involved Gary, Gary Butler, yeah. mm. <laughs> um, by his own admission. So there's been a pause, and I also was told a manager has resigned. Um, so there's some kind of hold up now, um, and the people I talk to don't know when, they don't have a schedule for when everything will start again. In the meantime, of course, uh, Gid, JIDS is not taking any new patients. So the, the waiting list is just it's getting longer bulging. and longer. Mm. And then there's this problem about what happens to the 16 year olds, 17 year olds, maybe even 15 year olds actually when they get there, um, who will never have seen anyone um, for the length of their adolescence, as it were, mm. and at 17 can go onto Bumped an adult, adult list. And, then... and at that point, <laughs> all bets are off because, you know, the adult service specification for um, gender dysphoria, for treating gender incongruence, is, was written in 2019. It's, CAS has not had any influence on it whatsoever. And it is a whole different ball game. There is no mandatory psychological assessment at all. You can self-refer. You don't need to go to your GP. You so can how just... many how many appointments would it need? Two, hypothetically. Two to get on hormones, um, and you need only need one clinician within that service to sign off a mastectomy. And um, part of the because there are very long adult waiting lists as well. Part of the um, NHS is England's attempt to get rid of the adult waiting lists or to bring them down is to introduce these new, what they call pilot services. Um, there's four of them at the moment. One of them is run by Dr. Christine Mimna, the person who makes <clears throat> the equation between disclosing sexual abuse and disclosing, disclosing gender identity. But these pilot services are explicitly ideological and affirmatory, you know, run by trans people for trans people. We believe you, yeah. <laughs> um, you will there's, be- You're not given time to think. 
it doesn't seem like there's much room, given the presentation of these services online and the things that their leaders say <laughs> in interviews, it doesn't seem like there's, especially these pilot ones, which are embedded in sexual health services, run by LGBTQ clinicians quite often. Um, there's just not a lot of room to imagine skepticism here. It seems much more like, you know, you're here, we'll give you what you need. Mm. And it is described as a need. Mm. Another one of the knock-on effects, presumably, of the um, the long waiting lists and the, the shutting down of the Southern Hub, or not the shutting down, the, the shelving of it for now, the stalling of it, um, is that um, presumably other suppliers will be popping up. Yes, so um, that does seem to be happening. So... Uh, I think a month or so ago, um, it was in the news that there was a new private provider called uh, Gender Plus um, had arrived on the scene and it was run by Dr. Aidan Kelly, who had been at JIDS. And um, it was also, if you look at the staff list on their website, there are people who describe themselves as working at JIDS in December. So I would say there's a crossover of JIDS staff. Um, and they are very keen to see um, children who are on the waiting list, as far as I can see, it's a bit unclear what exactly they're offering. Mm. <laughs> I must admit, because in the they told the Times that they were preparing to be able to prescribe hormones to teenagers. On their website, they say that they are not yet regulated by the Care Quality Commission. I think they would have to be regulated by the Care Quality Commission mm. if they were to offer hormones. So it's, hormones is different from puberty blockers. Yes, it is. Um, and so they haven't ever said explicitly, as far as I can tell, that they are interested in offering puberty blockers. But yes, yeah, so there's, an, there's a private, a growing private market to take up the slack here. And quite often people involved are people who've worked for JIDS or are working for JIDS. Is there any, um, do you detect any concern that this is happening, um, that there's this growing market, that the, the children, that the waiting list is growing, that the Southern now has well, I think um, you could, in in uh, in the NHS England's uh, interim service specification, um, it's in sort of bold red lettering that um, they strongly advise against procuring puberty blockers or ho hormones from an unregulated no source. And do you know anything about the the education um, services that that um, Gary was supposed to be overseeing? Um, they were, they were, so what were they formulating in Great Ormond Street as far as you well, know? Well, they were no. formulating training materials for clinicians who would then be working on the ground with um, patients. And all, what I know about that is that there was deep discord about what should be in the training materials, um, whether there should be anything about affirmation, whether there should be anything about puberty blockers, because actually Cass's guidance is that um, the service should be psychosocial, not endocrinological, mm -hmm. and there'll be different service specifications for puberty blockers coming out later. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's not the remit of the, according to some anyway, it's not the remit of this team to produce um, advice about puberty blockers. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe that there was some discord about that. And meanwhile, up north, what's happening there? That was always supposed to um, be opened later than the Southern Hub. The Southern Hub was supposed to start first. So I think that April 2024 was the um, date mentioned for the Northern Hub. I mean, what I know there is that the Leeds um, Children's Hospital seems to be involved, and that's the endocrinology department that was involved in the satellite clinic in Leeds that was associated with JIDS. Um, I also know that both hospitals, again, are part of various kite mark or charter mark um, transactivist uh, schemes. For instance, the Northwest um, has one called the Navajo kite mark or the Nav Navajo charter mark scheme mm. and the older hay just got accredited. Mm. It's hard to get a grasp on what accreditation means because I've had a look around, I can't mm. find anything, but I did find a Navajo newsletter from 2019 that was repeating outdated facts about um, children who are trans-identified committing suicide, um, saying that half of trans-identified children attempt suicide. I mean, that's just yeah. not true. So, and it also had like, um, you know, banner making workshops for trans pride advertised. So it seemed like a quite a transactivist approach that they were adopting. And now they are accrediting all the hay. So I'd be interested to see how that's going to filter down to affect the work of those in the Northern Hub who are trying to resist affirmation. And how do you see it resolving itself? The... Um, <laughs> well, because obviously I mean, there, are, there are there are troubled children um, waiting lists are growing. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, this is 
my opinion, having yeah. observed it, um, that there obviously, to me, it seems like there's a bit of naivety amongst NS NHS managers about the deep intractable ideological differences between clinicians in this area. I mean, there's huge differences about treatment and about how, how things should be done. So I think managers need to become a bit more savvy about what's, mm. you know, the sorts of people that are involved in this area because it tends to attract activists. Well, and it's problematic, isn't it? Because the guy who's at the head of um, the National Programme Board for Gender Services, James Palmer. Dr. James Palmer. So he's the head of, head of gender services, basically, both adult and children in the NHS, in NHS England. And um, he's been there for years. So he's been there through all of the um, problems that JIDS had. And I did speak to a couple of people who said um, they can't really understand why <laughs> um, he hasn't, more focus hasn't been on him. Mm. But anyway. What, what did they say? Well, they said that, you know, he, the, the blame is focused very heavily on Polly Carmichael, yeah. but, you know, he was in charge throughout and he's still in charge of basically a system where you've got one uh, service specification for children that is quite cautious and exploratory. And then you've got one for 17 year olds plus, which is incredibly yeah. gung ho and uh, affirmative. So, you know, let's hope that they're going to look at that. But a few years ago, he gave an interview, I think, to the Westminster Forum where he said some strange sounding things, not very cautious sounding things about how he thought that the NHS should prepare for a scenario where one to, where one to three percent of the population um, presented with some kind of gender issue. And he said it was just obviously a good thing that patients were getting younger and younger in the in JIDS, um, because surely it was a good thing if, you know, that the clinicians were able to help them as early as possible. And by help them at that point, it meant put them on Prescribe, drugs, yeah. affirm them, put them on drugs. Yeah. So he doesn't seem from that, maybe his attitudes have changed since then. But, you know, at that point, he seemed to not really understand the complexity of these, these patients and the fact that affirmation might not be the right thing for them. So I suppose possibly um, the fact that Southern has been paused is therefore a good thing if it means that... Well, if it means they can iron out these issues, I would say mm. yes, yes. Um, What's your feeling from having spoken to people about ironing out issues? Is it well? That's I don't. I'm or? afraid I don't know. I mean, I I just I don't have a complete oversight of the whole thing. But I think that um, CAS seems to have, like for instance, I believe that the training materials are do have to be signed off by um, senior clinicians that are not directly involved in the hub, for instance. So it's to be hoped that um, there are independent review boards that who who are not who are composed of, of pediatricians mm. and psychiatrists that are not already immersed in the gender debate that can actually apply um, standard methodologies about evidence um, to this area. Because I think what seems to be happening is quite often anyone who has a history of affirmation is just um, is unable to to think otherwise about this area. And it seems like a bit of flexibility and thinking would be useful. So there's, there's not an element of hope then in terms of I think, well, things are definitely forward. better than they were. Mm. Yes, um, I think it's all to play for. We've talked about um, the clinical side of things, but um, did, have you spoken to any, did you speak to any parents? Did any parents come to you while you were? Yes, I spoke to um, a number of parents, um, some, some were anonymous, in fact, nearly all were anonymous. Were they, were they um, keen to talk to you? Were they anxious? Or? Um, yes, these ones were very keen to talk to me. I mean, these, but these are people who are have been horrified by JIDS, who feel very upset and frustrated about the way um, JIDS has um, has been. And this, the old, the old JIDS, the, the old JIDS. But I mean, JIDs. yes, mm. I I spoke in particular to a mum who is currently seeking a judicial review against NHS England. She has on the record. She's on the record, yes. She's on the record and she's um, happy to be on the record. She thinks it's very important, so it's quite brave of her. But um, her has, she has a child who is trans-identified and is being affirmed by an estranged partner and is on the waiting list um, and will probably be seen by adult services soon. So she's very worried about that. So the ju judicial review that she wants to bring, she and another parent, is about these... Um, this vulnerable cohort of 17 to 25 year olds. I mean, it should, it's worth mm -hmm. saying that in, in, in um, 
it's established practice in other areas of mental health to treat 17 to 25 year olds as a specific pathway that's not quite adult or it's not adult in the same way. And in fact, as somebody said to me, it's a beautiful irony that the Tavistock, the home of JIDS, has a 17 to 25 year old pathway in CAMS in child and adolescent mental health, but, um, but not in not in gender services as, as usual, it's exceptionalized. But these, you know, emotional maturity is still to fully develop. Mm. Prefrontal cortex is yet to grow yeah. in properly. Mm. You don't want to be making decisions too hastily. Um, so that's, this mother was absolutely distraught, Anna, about, you know, what's gonna happen to her child when she gets to the adult service. Mm. One of the um, people who um, sounded an alarm bell early on was David Bell. Um, what does he think about what happened? What did, what the future for Jids looks like? What did he well, say? Well, he you? he he expressed concern on a, in a couple of areas. One of them was um, the way. Well, he actually was um, quite scathing of the fact that Polly Carmichael is still head of Jids, given what he thinks of as the failures of the service on her watch that he thinks have been manifest through the judicial review, through Barnes's book, and through the cast review, in mm. fact. Um, he was also scathing about Gary Butler's involvement in the new um, hub, Southern Hub. Again, he said, you know, that this is a person who was involved in a what he considers to be a failed service that, you know, when there were failures in, he thinks, safeguarding, record keeping, um, all sorts of things. Um, so he doesn't really understand why Butler is present um, in the new hub. And he was also expressed grave worry um, about the 16 and 17 year olds, what's going to happen mm. to them, given the way the adult services are and given this complete um, disparity between the approaches, well, the, the, the preferred approach or the idealized approach in the ch children's service, which is the one that CAS would like to enact, and the way things are in the adult services where, as far as we can see, no one is reviewing that at the moment. Why is that? Is it untouchable? I don't think it's untouchable. I mean, surely it can't be. It's the NHS. It's, the NHS. it's got to be exactly. um, touchable. But I suppose um, that you would definitely want to start from all sorts of reasons. You would want to start with the child childhood service first um, because they are the most vulnerable cohort. Um, I And I suppose as if Cass, Cass's vision is enacted then that will be, it will become more and more insistent that there has to be some kind of knock-on effect on the adult service because for a start, there's supposed to be a transition, a managed transition between the childhood and the adult. You know, you're supposed to, um, Cass talks about how, what that would look like in ideal scenarios. There would be like children with very, or 17 year olds with very complex presentations would be managed carefully mm. into the new service. But there's no suggestion to me anyway that looking on that the adult service is particularly geared up for children with complex presentations. It seems very affirmative. So um, I think this the, the, the problems of the adult service will become more and more apparent, I think. But And I don't think it's intractable, but I do think that the, the level of ideology in these services and the adult services in particular mm. is high. And, well, it's worrying, isn't it? Because the, the children are just going to, not the children, the 17 year olds, the 16 year olds are just going to be rushed through if there's a problem with what's happening with the children's well, area. Well, I mean, they, they're they still actually adult waiting lists too. So, but the thing about the, the letters sent by um, James Palmer to all 17 year olds is that you can you can be moved onto the adult list, but you can retain the start date of the child, uh, that when you first joined the child, the children's list, or oh, the minors list. So you um, bump up the adult so list. So that bumps you up. Right. So um, if you've been on the uh, childhood list for two years, it, you'll be counted as if you've been on the adult list for two years. So, yeah, that's quite worrying. It seems like there's just um, significant ideological struggle within the operation altogether. Yeah, I think that's Although fair. there is hope uh, in that um, the teaching implements will be regulated by outsiders once they see fit to pass pass those I on. Do you think that right. that is... Did, did anyone you speak to give the impression that there's a... a, a, a well, surely there's a strong wish to push things forward, to make it yes, work? Yes, I mean, I think they... I think... So I think... Um, Many people involved in, in, in the construction of the new services are aware of the urgency of this and really do want to produce something that um, is beneficial to the, well, I think everyone wants to produce something that's beneficial to the patients, but you know, um, some of them uh, want to connect that up with pediatric practice more generally. I would say, you know, people who have learned the lessons 
from JIDS now involved in constructing the new services. Right. Um, and, you know, CAS is clearly deeply involved in um, keeping oversight of the whole thing. So to that extent, I think there's a lot of positives to be taken away here. Um, Yes. So, Kath, thank you so much for spending so much time digging into this. It's a really important issue. It's a fascinating read. Um, it's clearly very interesting to see how this is going to develop. Um, and I'm going to watch it with great interest. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to Kathleen Stock for joining us here at Unheard and for her fascinating insights into what's happening in our gender identity services at the moment in Britain. We shall watch the developments with great interest. Do read her investigation and subscribe to Unheard.